The Nuffield Department of Medicine has teamed up with Science Oxford Live for their healthy season. Dr Diane Newbury talks about specific language impairment which affects hundreds of thousands of British children, causing difficulties in speaking and understanding. So I'm going to talk about um, speech and language disorders. This is a very common childhood problem. Um, it's estimated that about 40% of paediatric referrals and about half of statements of ed special educational need include some concerns about the child's speech and language needs. But the term speech and language disorders is actually an umbrella term and um, the children that are called speech and language disorders probably have very different problems and for very different reasons. So, for example, this term would include children with, um, who have speech and language needs which are secondary to more pressing medical needs such as autism, epilepsy. Um, it would also include a group of children uh, here who have... Um, their speech and language problems are their primary deficit. And this includes things like specific language impairment, speech sound disorder, verbal dyspraxia. So for example, a child with verbal dyspraxia has problems um, moving their facial muscles in, with the fine movement and speed that's needed for speech. And this can make their speech sound quite slurred. So a lot of these primary um, speech and language disorders are classified according to the kind of speech problem that the child has. And then we have this group of disorders at the bottom here which don't necessarily include any speech problems, but nonetheless are highly related to speech and language problems. So things like dyslexia, ADHD, coordination disorder. Okay. So in, in my lab... Um, at the Churchill, we study um, a disorder called specific language impairment. So this is a severe and persistent speech and language disorder, which is unexpected. So from this uh, diagnosis, we exclude anybody who has autism or any of those primary medical conditions, anybody who doesn't have normal intelligence, um, or any other reason that we can think of that might be causing their speech and language uh, problems. So rather than me going through a list of diagnoses, uh, diagnostic criteria, probably the easiest thing to do is just to show you a couple of videos of children who have specific language impairment. I'm not a speech and language therapist, but I could tell you that those children have speech and language problems. They, they qu have quite severe speech and language problems. And these two videos actually come from um, a video on YouTube, which was um, produced by a phasic called Speaking Out. And these two children both attend a special speech and language unit in London and they both have a diagnosis of SLI. So what this shows quite nicely is although they both have a diagnosis of SLI, they have quite different speech and language problems. So the first boy spoke quite slowly and deliberately and obviously was searching for the words and trying to plan what he was going to say, whereas the second child spoke quite quickly and actually used quite complex sentence structures, but some of it didn't always make a lot of sense. I think the most obvious thing about this video, especially when you compare it to the other two videos, is that Jake there doesn't really have... Uh, you, if you listen to him, you might think he was using slightly immature language, but you wouldn't necessarily think that he had a disorder as such. And I've put here the SLI affects between 2 and 7% of preschool children, but an awful lot of them are either misdiagnosed, like Jake, who was diagnosed to have a behavioural problem, and then they realised, as he explains here, that actually his language problems were making it difficult to understand, and this was what was causing his behavioural problems. So a lot of cases of SLI are either misdiagnosed or not diagnosed at all. Um, because it's quite hard sometimes to distinguish between a child's language problems and other developmental problems. Although we say SLI is this very specific language problem, it's quite often to, difficult to tease apart those different aspects. And then this final video just shows um, an adult with SLI. So another thing that a lot of people say to me is, well, these language problems, they're a childhood problem. People must grow out of them. They don't affect the person for the, throughout their life.
So again, um, if you met Sophie here, you may not realise that she had a speech and language impairment, but she's telling us that the thing that's really difficult for her is understanding and processing language in real time. And if you think about it, the amount of information that you're taking on board when you're listening to language, that's a really fast processing um, problem. And I always think of it as if you learn a language at school, say French, if you go to a foreign country and you're talking to someone in French, you, if you're really concentrate, you could probably keep up with the conversation, provided they don't use language that's outside of your standard kind of phrase book. And I guess this is kind of what it's like to have SLI, that you always have to man maintain this concentration and think about what's going on, whereas for the rest of us, it's really something that's quite natural and we don't have to pay much attention to. So I think it must be very tiring um, to have specific language impairment. So one thing that we do know about SLI is that it runs in families, and this has been reported anecdotally and scientifically for quite a long time now. And this gives us a good idea that there's probably some underlying genetic contributions involved. But it's what we call a complex genetic disorder. So we don't think that it, it follows the same pattern as kind of classical genetic syndromes like cystic fibrosis, the kind of classical genetic things that you've probably heard of. Um, and we call these monogenic disorders. And these monogenic disorders are caused by mutations which are changes in the DNA sequence that prevent the production of a given protein. So they, chain, they have a deleterious effect upon the function of that protein, and the lack of that protein causes this breakdown of biological processes and pathways, and that's what causes the disorder. So, for example, in cystic fibrosis, a mutation means that there's a protein in your lungs that normally pumps gunk out of your lungs but can't do so because it doesn't work properly anymore. And we don't think that this is the kind of genetic um, components that underlie SLI. Instead, it's what we call a complex disorder. And here I'm going to make the distinction between a genetic mutation and a genetic variation. So there's some big, big sequencing projects going on which are looking at variations in genetic sequences between individuals. And we know that there's about 15 million sites of common genetic variations between individuals. And these sites are not necessarily <coughs> mutations. They might occur within genes, but they don't take out the protein. And that's kind of the distinction between a mutation and a variation. But um, instead, what they might do is subtly alter the function of that protein, the efficiency with, with, with which that protein works. So you can imagine that if you carried variations in lots of related proteins involved in the same biological process, you might be less efficient at getting to the end of that biological process. You still are capable of producing all the proteins, but you do so in a less efficient way. And that's what we call a complex disorder. And I quite like the example that I quite like to give is metabolic um, processes. So we all know people who, are, who have a very high metabolism and they're lucky enough to carry genetic variations which mean that the enzymes which metabolise their food work very efficiently and very well. And then there's others of us who are not quite so lucky, we have to watch what we eat. We still have a metabolism, we're still perfectly capable of breaking down all the food and producing the energy, but we do so less efficiently or slowly. And that's just because we carry different variations of those enzymes. So the fact that complex disorders involve these multiple different variations across different genes means that the exact combination of these risk variants can vary from one person to the next. So if we took one person with SLI, we wouldn't necessarily expect them to carry the same variations as another person with SLI. And it also means that if we look at, looked at a single variant in isolation, that would probably only have quite a small effect upon the uh, upon the um, cause of SLI because there's multiple variations which are all working together. So given that everything that I've said about how complex SLI is at the language level, how little we understand about the processes underlying it and how complex the genetics is, the question really is how do we begin to identify these causal or contributing genetic factors? And the answer to that is that we take an unbiased approach to gene identification. So we screen all of the chromosomes in the human genome. 
So uh, there's a couple of different ways we do this, and, this is, and they're, they're called linkage and association. So the first method here, linkage, uh, we do in families, and we sample the genetic material at, at various sites across each of the chromosomes. And using this information, if we look within families, we can almost reconstruct the way that chromosomes are inherited. So in this cartoon here, the father, uh, this child has inherited this purple chromosome from his father, whereas this child has inherited the pink chromosome with a small purple patch on it here. Um, the blue didn't come out so well, but uh, each child has inherited half green and half blue chromosome from their mother, but in opposite orientations. So if we know that both these children are affected by SLI, we can, if we had to take a bet on where those genetic variations lay, we would say, well, they're probably somewhere in this purple region because that's the only region that they've both inherited the same copy of. And this uh, cartoon just shows one chromosome, but if we do that for all 23 chromosomes within, between one pair of brothers and sisters or siblings, then we would be able to narrow down the, um, the number of chromosome regions from 23 chromosomes to 50%, so 12 and a, no, 11 and a half. <laughs> um, and if we did, then did that across hundreds and hundreds of families, we'd be able to narrow it down even further and further and further until we just ended up with these very small chromosome regions that were shared uh, more often than we would expect by chance alone. Okay, so that's linkage. Association is a slightly different approach, but answers a similar kind of question. And here we're looking at specific genetic variations. So before I said that there's these big projects to map and sequence variations across the genome. What we do is we look, we sample these variations and we compare the frequency of these variations between cases and controls, so affected individuals and unaffected individuals. And you can imagine in the simplest of cases, if we were looking at a monogenic or this single gene disorder, all of our cases would carry the given genetic variation that was necessary and sufficient to cause the disorder, and we'd never ever find it in any of our controls. Of course, in, uh, in a complex disorder, instead what we're looking at are these kind of um, mosaic patterns, and we're looking for something that's more frequent in our cases than in our controls. And then uh, the last method that we can use now is whole genome sequencing. So you probably read in the press and heard on the news recently that we can now sequence every single base of DNA for every single chromosome within an individual. And that's a relatively cheap and simple thing to do. And people quite often say to me, well, if you can sequence, why don't you just sequence someone with SLI and then you'll have the answer. And the answer to that is because there's so much variation. This method works very well if we're looking for a mutation, something that prevents the production of a protein. But if we're looking at variation, if we were to sequence my genome and your genome, then we would expect to see about a million differences between us two. So the question there is which of those million differences are contributing to the language problems and which of them are just normal variation. And it's very hard to tell those things apart. So we've applied the linkage and association methods that I've been talking about um, to a collection of 300 UK families, all of whom have a child affected by SLI. Um, we use linkage techniques to identify shared regions on chromosomes 16 and 19. So they were shared between siblings more often than we would expect by chance. And then we use this association, so comparing between cases and controls within those families. Um, across chromosome 16, we were able to identify variations in two genes, which have these catchy names here, ATP, 2C2 and CMIP. Um, and the, the variations in these genes were correlated with short-term memory performance in these children. So children who carried the variation had a reduced short-term memory performance. And short-term memory is thought to be important for language learning. And now we're moving on and we're saying, well, how do we then link that variation? All we've done really is identified a correlation. What we want to do now is have some kind of functional link. How do these variants affect the function of the protein? How is that protein important for language development? And what's going wrong in SLI? But the study that I want to go into a little bit more detail about today is a study that we've been doing uh, in an isolated population who live on the Robinson Crusoe Island. 
which is a South Pacific island uh, just off the coast of Chile here. It has uh, very limited access even now. Uh, I don't know if you can see on this photo here, but that is the airstrip there. So it is possible to get an airplane there, but I wouldn't really recommend it. You can get a boat out there, but it, it, again, it's very treacherous to actually land at the island and it takes a couple of days to get there. So even now, there's very limited access to and from the island. It's called the Robinson Crusoe Island because in 1704, Alexander Selkirk allegedly had an um, argument with the captain of his ship as they were passing this island and he said, right, I've had enough, let me off. And his captain did and left him on this island where he lived in this cave uh, for five years in solitude until he was rescued. And that apparently is who Daniel Defoe based the story of Robinson Crusoe upon. So as geneticists, the reason that we're quite interested in the population who live on this island is they're what we call a founder population. And by this I mean that they're a small, closely related population that are quite isolated. So the current population of the island is about 600 individuals and we know that the majority of these individuals come from eight founder families who recolonised the island in 1877. Um, so this was a Swiss baron who bought the island from the Chilean government and went there with his friends and these eight who created these eight founder families and about 80% of the current population have one of these founder surnames, so we know that they're related to these founder individuals. And for us as geneticists, that's great because it reduces the gene pool. The amount of genetic variation within these individuals is much reduced because of the fact they're also closely related and the island is so isolated, so there's very little genetic material coming in. The reason that we're interested in this particular population as geneticists who are interested in speech and language impairments is that 35% of the colonising children, so these are children who are related to these founder families, are, uh, meet the criteria for SLI. A further 27.5% have secondary language deficits, so they have speech and language problems, but they, they would be excluded from SLI because they have intellectual deficit or other medical conditions which might explain their language problem. And then the remaining third of the children have normal language. And this compares with about 4% of the non-colonising children, so these are children who live on the island but were not born there and are not related to these founder individuals. And about 4% of those meet the criteria for SLI. And this is what we would expect in any other population. So for us, this is a very interesting population. And when we dug into the relationships between the affected individuals a little bit deeper, we found that 88% of the individuals with SLI could be related back to a single pair of these founder brothers. So up here, one brother here and one brother here. And the majority of the affected individuals fall within this enormous <coughs> family. And actually, we think that probably more of the affected individuals are related back to these brothers, but we can't quite link them back. So at this point, when we drew this pedigree, we threw away uh, our scientific rationale and ignored everything that I've said to you previously about SLI being a complex disorder. And we said, well, what if these um, founder brothers here had a mutation which has subsequently spread through this population and which is directly causing their speech and language impairments. And in order to find out whether that was true, we did an experiment known as exome sequencing. So here we don't sequence the whole genome, but what we do is sequence the genes in the genome. So the genome is... Um, the, the genes in the genome only actually make up about 1% of the coding sequence. The, the rest of the 99% rest of the genome, we really don't know what it does. So this is an efficient way to look for mutations in those genes because we don't have to do quite so much sequencing. So we sequenced about 25,000 of genes and this was about 38 million base pairs of DNA. And we asked, can we find a coding mutation, so something that changed the sequence of the gene which was present in all five of those language-impaired individuals, which was novel, by which I mean it had never been described in any person who had been sequenced before, and which changed the protein code in sequence and was predicted to have a deleterious effect upon the function of that protein. 
And the answer to that was no, we couldn't. <laughs> to cut a long story short. But we did find nine of these mutations which occurred in at least three of the five affected individuals. So we went with those and we looked for those mutations in the larger island population sample. And we found that one of these mutations in particular was present in a much higher number of language impaired individuals, so about half of the language impaired individuals compared to 10% of, of the language normal, normal islander. Islanders. This had never ever been described in any control populations and when we looked at UK controls indeed we found we found that the mutation was not there. But when, then when we looked at South American controls we found that this what we thought was a mutation was actually present in 10% of our South American controls. So this is not actually a mutation it's quite a common variation in South American populations but it is specific to South American populations. It hasn't spread to other populations. But nonetheless, <laughs> it's not the end of the story because the frequency in South American controls is about, was about 10%. And this fitted quite nicely with the frequency that we saw in our language normal individuals on the island. In our colonizing families, so our families which were related to the founder individuals, we saw that the frequency of this variant rose and that's what we'd expect because of the founder population effect um, and but the real increase in this variant the only popular the only subset in which this variant was much more common than we would expect was in the language impaired individuals so then we said okay so so maybe it's not a mutation maybe we were right all along SLI is a complex disorder we're looking for risk variants maybe this represents a risk variant so under this hypothesis those two founder brothers would have carried a higher um, complement of these risk variants and they would have subsequently spread through the population because there's not so much incoming genetic material they would be maintained at a much higher frequency than you would see in a normal population and to see whether this was true, we sequenced this candidate gene in 140 SLI um, cases from, the U from our UK population. And we identified three variants in, in the gene sequence which altered the protein coding sequence or were predicted to be damaging to the function of that protein. Um, and this was at a much higher frequency than we saw these variants in the control databases. All of these variants were either completely absent, so novel variants, or had a very, very low frequency in those control databases. So we would hypothesize at this point that variants in this gene do contribute to risk for SLI um, in, a, in this complex model. So just to summarize what I've said, SLI is a complex disorder at the language level, at the underlying process level, and at the genetic level. But we think that it is possible to identify contributory variants and mutations by the study of families and individuals affected by SLI. And we, we think that we've probably started to identify these genes, but as we identify more of them, what we hope is that as we identify the genes, it will help us to understand the underlying biological processes, and that will then help us to understand the differences between different children with SLI and whether children with SLI have the same kind of language problems as, say, children with autism who have language problems. It's, and these are all the kinds of questions that we would like to answer as we identify more genetic variations. Um, I've just put an acknowledgement slide at the end here, so I should say much of the work that I've spoken about I didn't actually do, but was done by my lab members, uh, Ron, Fabiola, Rose and Nula. Uh, this is our Chilean collaborator, who has done all the work on the Robinson Crusoe Island. Um, the, a lot of the sequencing work was done in Nijmegen in collaboration with Simon Fisher. Uh, we're funded by the MRC and the John Fell Fund and St John's College. And uh, my website and email are here. You can follow me on Twitter. And I think there's some postcards around that have all the website and contact information on them.